surgeon. This isn't my first book. In 1915, my enthusiasm over twilight sleep led me to pick up my pen, prompted by a desire to hasten the day when all women might be free from hours and sometimes days of agonizing childbirth pain. I wrote the book on scopolamine morphine anesthesia. I paid a printer to make the book for me. It was not a bestseller. Obstetrics with twilight anesthesia is as different from obstetrics without it as the world in peacetime from the world at war. But I started in the middle of the story. If you have a few moments, allow me to take you back to the beginning, to my first medical practice in Chicago, 1892. My first genuine sick call was from a German woman who had lost two children from so-called cholera and phantom. And now her one-year-old was sick with the same disease. I examined the baby and found an acute intestinal infection. At the neighboring drugstore, I bought a funnel and catheter and irrigated the baby's bowel. I taught the mother to do so. I remember, as if it happened yesterday, gave the baby no food except boiled water with perhaps a drop of Kimberlin. I will return this evening. At lunch, a fellow boarder, a young Eastern doctor with fine offices, congratulated me. I hear you have a new patient. Yes, an acute intestinal infection. I irrigated the baby and showed the mother how. I'm going back tonight. Oh dear, I wish I could have seen you to tell you you cannot carry out all this hospital treatment you have learned. While she's probably already thrown out the catheter, call it a doctor who will give the baby some medicine. You must always give the baby some medicine, even if it's bread peels or sugar. I went to my little office bedroom, sat down and had a good cry. Then in there, resolving to give up the practice of medicine, if one practiced medicine just to bamboozle the public, I would have none of it. I had felt foolish for having been caught up in such a high-class swindling game. But I had promised to call again that evening, but I expected someone to peep through the crack in the curtain without answering the knock at all. I applied my knuckles to the door. It burst open as if by magic. The sick baby mother opened her arms and literally folded me into them, covering my neck and face with kisses. Air's besser! Air's besser! Now, if you feel you should have something to eat, then... No, no. I don't care if he never eats. If he gets well. I washed him out so nice. Just like you showed me. <laughs> in her joy, when the baby was well, she took him in her arms and went from one to another of the neighbors. Now, if your baby gets sick, don't you send for the men's doctor. You get the lady doctor. She give him no medicine, and she tells you what to do, and she wash him out so nice. <laughs> From that day, a clientele was assured. I've had a wonderful career, but allow me to go back even further and tell you about my roots. In 1823, my maternal great-grandfather, Reverend Lemuel Taylor, moved from Aurelius, New York, and bought out this Stony Creek farmland for a dollar and a quarter an acre from the government, a sale secured by President Monroe himself. Lemuel took with him his wife, his 10 children, his six in-laws, and 26 grandchildren. He traveled by way of Erie Canal and then by covered wagon to Buffalo, Cleveland, Detroit, and finally Rochester, at that time only a few log cabins. From Rochester, they cut their own land until they found a high ground overlooking a peaceful valley transversed with a noisy creek, Stony Creek. On the sloping land beside the creek, great-grandfather built a log cabin. In this log cabin, my mother, Alice, was born, Sarah, was born in 1830. My great-grandfather also died that year, just seven years after coming to the territory of Michigan. One antidote recalls the way he once threatened to punish one of his grandsons. Minor, I'm sorry to hear of your deviation from rectitude. And if such an abomination ever occurs again, I shall unbutton the sky and let it down on you. When this man, so rugged, so self-reliant, so even-handed, passed, he must indeed have felt as if death had unbuttoned the sky and let it fall, leaving his people groping in darkness. My father, Joshua Van Hoosen, was born six months prior to my mother's birth in Stony Creek. Father's family was poor. He had to pick thorns and sell them to the vi village wooden mill to earn enough money to buy his first pair of shoes. When a lad of ten, 
father worked for a sanctimonious and dishonest deacon who taught him that religion was no more than a cloak for iniquity. Father often warned me. You watch him. He's a Christian. <laughs> when Joshua was 14, he made an agreement with his father to pay him $100 for freedom from family obligations prior to his turning 21. By the time he was 18, primarily by splitting rails, he had completed payment of the debt. Shortly after securing his independence, Joshua caught the gold fever and headed for California. In 1853, he returned with his belly belt filled with gold and bought out enough home property for a homestead and farm. With a gold ring embossed with the nugget that he himself had dug, he married my mother on New Year's Day, 1854. They were both 23 years old. Their first child, Alice, was born one year later. It had been eight years since I had delivered Alice, so when Bertha came along, she came along with some town gossip. Sarah and Josh were either very lucky or mighty clever not to conceive biennially. I thought she was just revealing some middle-aged plumpies. <laughs> That year, 1863, there were two good physicians in Rochester, about a mile and a half from the farm in Stony Creek. Canadian twins, Jerry and Jesse Wilson. I waited as long as I could before calling a doctor. I endured the labor pains all night long on the 25th. I had Josh call for Jesse. He was married. Jerry was a bachelor. But Jesse didn't come, and Jerry was almost too late to be of any help anyway. Jerry took his good old time. I think he felt slighted because Sarah wanted his brother. By the time he arrived, climbed the stairs and deposited his stovepipe hat. Bertha had already arrived, kicking her placenta, waving her fists and howling. I was howling at the unfitness of a male midwife. And I had other reasons for crying. It was 1863. My world was at war. Fierce cruel civil war. I should, however, have been born laughing instead of crying, for I was the most fortunate of creatures, a wanted baby, a jubilee baby, rocked to sleep in the arms of my mother, ridden an a la carte horse on father's strong high boots, danced and tossed from the arms of one higher man into those of another, cuddled and trundled about by an adoring sister. I was delirious with joy. I remember being at a little gathering of women where each one of us was recalling the happiest moment in her life. I was already married and had a child of my own. It was when I said, it was when I was told that I had a baby sister. It is so vivid that it seems like an incident of yesterday. We had long planned and wished for a son. And I certainly took a ribbing from the townsman. The grocer, Sheboygan. The blacksmith, Sheboygan. The miller, Sheboygan. Our farm in Stony Creek was not just a tract of land devoted to agriculture. Here I received the rudiments of my education, especially how to meet realities. When I wanted playthings, I made them. Boats whittled out of scraps of wood. Cows, milk pans, and churns cut out of pumpkins. Playhouses filled with material for mold buildings. Dolls, dresses, and hats made from odds and ends. When I longed for companions, I made my choice of all the farm animals, the birds, and the fishes. When I just wanted to run, I had a 400-acre farm for my unrestricted arena. When I wanted to eat, the garden, the cellar, the bushels, the brambles, the roots, and the gums, they all fed me. I was never hungry. The debt I owe the farm, with its purling, spring-fed creek that pulses and curves like a life-giving umbilical cord over the length and breadth of the farm. Of course, I knew a lot about the origins of life from witnessing our livestock. Birth is such an inspiring demonstration of the beginning of life that every young child, long before the age of sexual awakening, should enjoy the ocular evidence of it. I was still a young girl when a daughter of a neighboring farmer took me aside and whispered in a sense of profound secrecy, I know something. Before she would tell me, we had to hide in the deep recesses of the straw stack. I know where babies come from. <laughs> well, who doesn't? I was disgusted with all this palaver over what I supposed everybody knew. I got up, disappointed, and walked away. How long have you known these things? I have always known them. Sheep shearing was a regular spring occurrence. 
Before shearing, the sheep were washed in the creek deep and wide at that time of year. This annual event reminded me of the outdoor baptismal ex exercises that took place in the village mill pond as climax to the winter revival meetings. The fervent injunctions given by the preacher to his flock sounded to me like the shouts of the hired men, jump in Jesus and God Almighty, as they bound themselves in the water and washed the sheep white as snow. At baptismal time, Father and I always found a secluded spot overlooking the mill pond from which we could get a good view of the emergent spectacle. And as we walked slowly home behind the bedraggled neophytes, Father would comment, Just like my sheep, they're doused in the mill pond, then fleeced good in the church. <laughs> Although Father was a confessed atheist, he was apparently glad to have me go to prayer meetings, revivals, and church whenever I wanted to. Helmita, wife of Big Jim the farmer, was sponsoring the prayer meetings. When she and her husband drove by our house on Sunday mornings, they often saw Father with one leg of his homemade trousers draped over his boot top as he stood, leaning on the front gate. Helmita would call out to him, Good morning, Joshua. Won't you come find Jesus with me? What, Helmita? Father always replied in the most irreverent and uncomplimentary language. <laughs> but it never discouraged the lady from repeating the invitation Sunday after Sunday. Once, Stepping to the front of the classroom and crossing her hands over her round, fat belly, she called out in a loud, clear, unctuous voice, Bertha, won't you lead us in prayer? Me? Yes, you. This was a thrust at father, a blow below the belt. I would show her that I was a daughter worthy of my father. I rose in my seat and with great piety, really trying to look like a saint I had seen in a picture somewhere. I clasped my hands in front of me and slowly repeated the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, I experienced no stage fright or timidity. In fact, nothing could have restrained me. It was my moment to vindicate my Father. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When I got home, Mother was still working in the kitchen, setting the table for pancakes and winding up the weight in Grandmother's old clock. I burst in. What do you think? Almeida asked me to lead in prayer because she wanted to run on Father. What did you do? I did it. At this juncture, Father entered with a piece of wood to be deposited in the great wood stove, where it would burn all night long. Mother spoke as she opened the stove to help him. Bertha has been at the schoolhouse attending prayer meeting, and Almeida asked her to lead in prayer. <coughs> Father almost wrecked the stove, he let go of the tongue so quickly. And what did you do? I did it. Father's blue eyes twinkled, and with the spirit worthy of a martyr, he gave me this unstinted praise. That's right. Make them hunt their holes. Let them know there's a God in Israel. I had pleased my father. I had vindicated his honor. Since then, I have had degrees conferred upon me, and have been honored in special ways. But nothing has since brought about the thrill that was brought by those homely, rugged words. In spite of Father's skepticism, we were taught that the Bible was a much revered book and that every word in it was golden. Imagine our feelings when we found in it a nasty word that everybody said no nice person would use. Like most young people, I reveled in secrets. Of all secrets, None offered so much a sport as in a game which a small group of girls my age indulged. We invented a contest in finding the greatest number of these taboo words. They were good old Anglo-Saxon words expurgated from modern Bibles. What tickled us most of all was to see how pleased our parents and teachers were when they saw us thumbing over the leaves of the Bible. It saved us from having to set the table, fill the wood box, or even let the dog out. I imagined how Mother would lift her arching black eyebrow if she only knew the little marks I was making on a bit of paper only meant that I had found another awfully dirty word. <laughs> Thinking about reading reminds me that when I was five years old, I only knew a few letters of the alphabet. At that age, Alice had been able to read any chapter in the Bible. When it was noise about the village that Josh Van Hoosen Ginger, my nickname, didn't know her letters, the family cried was touched. 
In an attempt to teach me, he laid the rural New Yorker across his knee and called to me. Come, Bertha. Let's see if you can tell me some of these letters. I stood very serious in front of him and gazed with fine interest at the rustic letters of the newspapers titled before me. What is this? He pointed to the letter O. I knew that one. O. What about this one? An easy one. I knew that, too. A. When he pointed to the letter E, it looked very queer and perfectly unfamiliar. And the more I looked at it, the surer I was I had never seen it before. Then, as I have often done in a dilemma, I made a joke. Crumbling the newspaper in my small hands, I rushed away, calling to Father. Booger man! Booger man! He ran after me as I expected, and the lesson ended in a wild game of tag. Father sighed and looked at Mother. I'm afraid she's going to he be like a He named the village moron. <laughs> it never occurred to anyone that I might have been interested in learning words instead of ABCs, like children nowadays are taught. No one seemed to think that I might be unconsciously progressive. I am a proud product of the public school system, the free schools that were always open whenever I was ready to enter. Father took me to the Rochester Academy, a graded public school, one and one half miles from Stony Creek. As Rochester was our post office and trading center, Father usually found it convenient to take me back and forth by horse and buggy. All of my studies interested me, especially arithmetic. Occasionally, as early as four in the morning, I surreptitiously lightened my kerosene lamp at my bedside to finish a problem that had baffled me the night before. If Mother discovered it, and she usually did, she would creep quietly into my room, blow out the light, and whisper, You'd better go back to sleep. After breakfast, you will have no trouble in doing your sums. As always, she was right. After three years in the Rochester School, I was sent to the Pontiac High School and entered the sophomore year. This change in schools necessitated my living in a boarding house during the five-day school week. Father came for me with a horse and buggy every Friday as soon as school closed and brought me back in time on Monday for the 8 o'clock recitation. For six years, three for Alice and then three for me, Father set everything aside in all kinds of weather to make the round trip to Pontiac twice every week. On cold, snowy mornings, after eating a breakfast Mother had prepared in time for us to leave by 5 o'clock, we were packed into the bobsled that had been filled with sweet-smelling straw, with hot bricks that Mother had heated in the oven, quilts and buffalo robes around us. We were ready to start. I could have graduated when I was 15, but I could not enter the University of Michigan until I was 16. So I continued an extra year in high school. I took French and German in addition to Greek and Latin, and thus obtained college credit for two extra languages. I did well in all of my studies, but the sole satisfaction that I derived from good marks was in reporting them to Father as we jogged along on Friday afternoons. One week, we had a particularly dreaded examination in geometry. Did you pass? I got 99.8. Why didn't you get 100? <laughs> well, no one in the class did. I was the highest one. <laughs> That's right. You make them hunt their holes. Let them know there's a God in Israel. <laughs> Father began whistling, slapped the horses back with the reins, and it seemed to me I could never be any happier. To disappoint Father was a great source of anguish. Nonetheless, I did disappoint him once by lying. No one in family ever lied. To Mother, honesty was a Bible injunction. To Father, honesty was a manifestation of good, prin good business principles and common sense. To Alice, honesty was evidence of good breeding and culture. Up until the senior year of, of high school, I had never been tempted to lie. Then, in a moment of false security, sin claimed me. During my last two years in Pontiac, I roomed with a lead of the land who at that time was engaged to Samuel W. Smith. One evening, Mr. Smith suggested our going to Detroit to see Edwin Booth in Hamlet. Mr. Lawyer had a, Mr. Smith had a lawyer friend who said he would like to take me. We could go into Detroit on the evening train and return on the midnight. 
I had never been on a train, never been to a theater, and had never had an escort. They planned to go Friday night. I could get father's permission when he came for me on Friday. I had never met Mr. Smith's friend, but I'd often heard father speak of him as a squirt. I was so positive that father would not approve of my going with him that when I asked his permission, I did not mention my escort's name. Alita and Samuel want me to go with them. After a thoughtful look at me, he nodded. All right, we'll come for you tomorrow morning. He drove away, and at that moment, my punishment began. That I had not made a statement that was, per se, false, did not mean I had not lied to father. Halita was very happy that I was going to go, but I was suffering even before we left for the train. <coughs> I could not bear to look at the man whom I now considered responsible for all my unhappiness. The theater was so enormous that I felt lost in it, but only for a moment, for just three seats ahead of us, I spied the village doctor who had been called at the time of my birth. Now there was no escape. I could almost hear Dr. Wilson talking to Father. Oh, why, hello there. So I hear you're going to have a new son-in-law soon? <laughs> I saw birth at the theater of Mr. Tripp. My misery was so great that I held the program in front of my face most of the time. I could not enjoy or even hear the words of the great actor. And at the end of the play, when most of the actors lay dead, I envied them. Aunt Julia, not father, came for me on Saturday morning. I confessed my lie to Aunt Julia. She did not seem to think things were so desperate, but I was inconsolable. Seeing dinner on the table when we arrived home, I took off my hat and sat down. Father served me in the quantities I liked, but by this time I was almost exploding. Looking at, but not seeing my plate, I confessed. Father, I lied to you. Alita went with Mr. Smith, and I went with Mr. Tripp. Silence ensued. I glanced up and saw tears rolling down Father's ruddy cheeks. I am sorry, Bertha. I left the table and went to the spare bedroom where I threw myself on the bed and gave way, gave way to uncontrollable grief. After a short time, Mother came and sympathized with me. You have had a hard lesson but it may be the best thing that has ever happened to you. She, as usual, convinced me that whatever is, is right. And I again re soon returned in public, a humble comfort to honesty is the best policy way of life. I never knew a time when it was not a foregone conclusion that I was to attend college. When it came my turn, I told mother that I was going to talk the money question over with father. She seemed surprised and a little perturbed. After dinner, father always lingered at the table and allowed the cat to make walk over its shoulders. The cat made furtive passes at his plate until father finally gave him a few bits to eat. I took this opportunity to present my financial program. Father, I have figured it all out. It will cost me $300 for the year in college. I would like to have that amount and spend it as I need it. You couldn't get through on that amount. I will. And what's more, I'll send you an expense account every time I need more money. Now, Bertha, I have plenty of money for you to live in a comfortable way in Ann Arbor, but I have not one cent for you to futter away. But if you want to try the way you say, it is all right with me. Father always lent me when I, money whenever I needed any, and the plan was happy for everybody. In 1880, I entered the literary department of the University of Michigan with a year's credit in French and German. I caught the fancy of Charles Mills Gailey, teacher of Latin and glamour man of the faculty. In the early spring, at the close of the Love Poems on Catalyst, Professor Gailey asked me, along with some other students, to remain after class. I was greatly perturbed, and became more so when he interviewed student after student and left me waiting. Finally, I was alone with this fascinating Irish man with a heart-robbing smile. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. I only wanted to ask you if you'd received gentleman callers. I never have, but I would. <laughs> May I come tonight? I consented. 
And this was the beginning of many unforgettable evenings together. We were walking in the twilight one evening when he apparently put his hand over mine. I wiggled it away, but a new and strange feeling flooded over me. It was of something of which I had never been before sensible. When we parted, he took both my hands in his. At this juncture, I gave a vocal expression of my mental state. I believe you are a bad man. Why did you say such a dreadful thing? I am here alone, without my parents, who expect me to take care of myself. You are my teacher, and I expect you to treat me how they would wish me to be treated. If you had been one of my classmates, I should have slapped you. I did not tell him that I had often heard father speak of delinquent girls. My girls can choose their own companions and marry anyone they want to. But if they get blistered, they will have to sit on those blisters, not I. In all my pre-college experience, I had never heard of a woman physician. Therefore, my cur freshman curiosity was whetted when I learned that the two young ladies who were living in a boarding house across from the sorority were studying medicine. They were Vassar products. Mary McLean and Harriet Barringer. Harriet was an eye catcher for every day wearing a long ermine cape and a hat made of peacock feathers. Often, when asked why I had chose medicine as a career, I have often been tempted to reply. It was a peacock hat, an ermine coat that first attracted me to the medical profession. <laughs> After my sophomore year, I turned my attention to what I would do with my life with positive curiosity. My family only laughed when, cross-legged like a grand llama in front of his prayer wheel, I took a seat on Mother's hair cloth sofa with my face towards his round black back and announced, I'm going to sit here until my mind is made up of what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Three days elapsed before I abandoned that hair cloth seat, convinced that medicine offered women more than any other occupation. I wanted to be my own boss to say as father often did. I could speak my mind on any subject, and the corn will continue to ripen, and the cows to give down their milk. I am a free man. I recognize the attractiveness of material necessities mandatory in the practice of medicine. A horse and buggy, now an automobile, an office, a home, and personal servants. It would be a pleasant sensation to feel that I was one of the indispensable citizens of the community. Perhaps, after all, in my choice of the medical career, unconsciously, I was responding to the call of the woman in me. Woman, preserver of life, to mitigate suffering and save life. Of one thing, I am certain. It was not the urge of money that influenced my choice, even though my financial need was great. I also considered the disadvantages, loss of sleep, irregular meals, exposure to weather, and contact with disease. But even these disadvantages are characters that spell life. Life in all its fullness. And I was not afraid of life. The Bible says you must be born again. After making my choice of the medical career, as far as the conduct of my life was concerned, I suffered a rebirth. Having entered college with advanced credit in French and German, I completed requirements for my AB degree at the end of the first semester of my senior year. I entered the medical department at once. Mother, in her powerful passiveness, was opposed to my study of medicine, and father felt that he must not act contrary to her wishes. Your mother cries whenever your studying of medicine is mentioned. And I cannot furnish money for you to do something that hurts you so much. Why not uh, teach school, or better still, come home and stay with us? I don't want her money. I can earn it. I arranged to continue my studies in the fall and to pay my expenses by waiting on tables for my board and room. Over the summer back on the farm, I first sold scales to farmer's wives and then picked berries for, for two cents a quart. Then, Dr. Mary McLean wrote me. Dr. McLean was the woman who had inspired me to study medicine and had just started a private practice in St. Louis. There is an opening here in the St. Mary Institute at St. Louis to teach calisthenics and physiology. 
I have never been even inside a gymnasium and know nothing about calisthenics. I am not competent to take this position. I've secured the position for you. Don't worry about the calisthenics. Come to St. Louis a couple of weeks early and take some courses. I moved in with Dr. McLean in early September. The day after my arrival, Dr. McLean invited me to a clinic at the city hospital. Seated in the big amphitheater, the pit of which was filled with patients in wheelchairs, I was enjoying the, watching the interns do the surgical dressings when I saw a probe go boring down into a deep wound. The whole room began to whirl and go into a tailspin. I heard, in a faraway voice, I heard Dr. McLean, Bertha, we will go now. I followed her, my heels clicking against the floor, for I could hardly lift them. We finally reached a bed, where after lying down a very few moments, I recovered. Although I had a week to recuperate, when, after, when we went to the Mullenby Hospital, my humiliating experience was repeated. Our seats were in the front row. I heard the patient climb upon the table. The curtain swayed. The covered legs and exposed patient came into view. My eyes blurred. I felt the floor sinking. Dr. McLean grasped my hand. Come, everything is so new here. I think it is too much for you to attend school and take the clinics. On the following Saturday, Dr. McLean was on, one, on her way to the clinics. You had better stay at home and rest. I'm not only going, but I'm going to stay till I faint. And when I come to, I'm going to remain, no matter how many times I faint. <laughs> We took front seats as usual, and sure enough, as soon as the curtain moved and the table came noising its way into the student side of the partition, I became ghastly faint. Dr. McLean reached for my hand. Come. I shook my head until the hairpins loosened in my hair like Lady Godava's threatened to cover my shame. No. Do you come? No. At this word, all my faintness vanished, never to return at any time. At the end of the term, Dr. Purcell, the principal, who knew how much I had enjoyed teaching, approached me. Will you teach another year? Of course we will increase your salary. No, I intend to study medicine and have too little confidence in myself not to keep an eye on the goal. I once wanted to be a lawyer, but I kept on teaching because I had a good job and married and had a family. And well, I'm still teaching. You are a wise little girl. Keep to your singleness of purpose. As for Dr. Mary McLean, she had an office in St. Louis for more than a year, yet she was still waiting for her first patient. In my initiation into medicine, Dr. McLean opened my eyes to the prejudice, the discrimination, and the paucity of opportunities that had to be reckoned with before success would be secured. In the fall of 1885, I presented my credentials to the University of Michigan Medical School. Without exception, the teachers and male students were fair and friendly to the women. The anathemas against hen medics came from the students in the literary department, both men and women. Dr. Cordonel Ford, head and professor of anatomy, was a master teacher, and the student who could not learn from him must have both been blind and deaf. He would enter the lecture amphitheater, lay aside his cane, uncover the cadaver, and then, pointing to the groin, begin. <clears throat> inguinal region, gentlemen. Today we will study the inguinal region. My finger is pointing to the inguinal region, gentlemen. Inguinal region. This region is covered with integument. I lift the integument and show the fascia beneath. Femoral artery, gentlemen. Finger pointing to femoral artery. Pencil tapping femoral artery. Femoral artery, gentlemen. Femoral vein, gentlemen. Finger pointing to femoral vein. Pencil tapping femoral vein. Femoral vein, gentlemen. Studying was unnecessary after listening to one of Dr. Ford's lectures, for he branded it into the brain and retina of the dullest dolt. Oliver Wendell's home paid him this tribute. It is worth the trip to Europe and back to hear a lecture given by Corden L. Ford. In the fall of 1886, the money I had earned while teaching in St. Louis had dwindled to a few dollars, so I took the position of teaching Ger German and mathematics in Saginaw, where Alice was teaching. The following spring, 1887, while still teaching, I learned that the position of demonstrator of anatomy at the University
University of Michigan Medical School was vacant. I applied, although I did not have my degree in medicine. Fortunately, my AB was accepted in lieu of my MD degree. And the position carrying a salary of $50 a month was mine. The study of anatomy, my favorite subject, was begun in the backyard at hog killing time. Without a peep into Gray's anatomy, I reveled in seeing what was under the skin. But how could I get enough knowledge of human anatomy to fill the position? And the only way out would be to go to Ann Arbor and dissect all summer. I spent every day from June till October in the dissecting room, rising at three in the morning and dissecting from four until noon. There were six of us who dissected all summer. I was glad to be in the dissecting room. It was never a gruesome place to me. While sitting in silent communion with my cadaver, I felt the presence of the divine architect of man more keenly than when I entered a church. My medical degree, hard as I worked for it, and as much as I battled it, brought me to no sense of competency. Responsibility for life of a patient frightened me. Tortured by a medical inferiority complex, I applied to the Women's Hospital in Detroit for a residency. The Board of Trustees, appreciating my strenuous services during the summer as medical student nurse, appointed me for the coming year. Since I had to begin my residency one month before graduation, it was necessary to take special private examinations in all senior subjects. On the way to the anatomy examination, I met a group of senior girls who began quizzing me. Can you name the foramina in the patris portion of the temporal bone? In a final, such questions are foolish and unfair. At this, they glibly rolled off the answer to it and to two other equally finical questions. Then my examination began. Can you name the foramina of the petrous portion of the temporal bone? <laughs> to my amazement, the anatomy teacher asked only those three questions. And to his amusement, I poured forth the answers with breathless fluency. Less than another minute, I should have forgotten them. I was kept busy listening to courses that required second time, attending operations that were performed in the surgical clinics, and at the same time demonstrating anatomy to earn a living. It seemed a short time before they pronounced us ready to graduate. Just before the graduation date, I was approached by a classmate. Bertha, will you contribute towards the purchase of a black silk dress for a woman student who has had to work her way through school? Yes, yes. But is every girl who's put herself through college going to receive a silk dress? You know, I'm a worthy candidate. You're different. Perhaps I was different. Life on the farm produces a kind of toughness. I made my graduating dress out of one of my old ones with my own hands. When I began service in the Women's Hospital in Detroit, my predecessor had left four postpartum patients, one delivered two days previously, and the other three several weeks before. All had fever. The day I arrived, the patient most recently delivered developed chills and became acutely ill. The first two cases I delivered had chills and fever on the third and fourth days. I had been on duty only two weeks before it dawned on me that every patient in the hospital had childbed fever. I called upon the shades of my Dutch ancestors to direct me until all was clean as blood of babes. I aired scrubbed boiled in soak in a bichloride mercury solution, the floors, mattresses, beds, <coughs> mattresses, patients, and doctor's gowns. I did this not once, but day after day. It was a strenuous, not to say exhausting fight. I was weary as well as worried. During these weeks, as soon as I fell asleep, I would see at the foot of my bed four tall coffins standing on end. On each coffin plate was the name of the patient and under it the significant information. Doctor by Bertha Van Hoosen. The dream was so real and impeaching that it would inadvertently awaken me, and slipping out of bed, I would revisit the ward to reassure myself that the patients were not in coffins and that I was not behind bars. No patient died, and after the first month, none developed fever. I have never regretted that harrowing experience, for I learned what could be done to prevent infection 
even under the most discouraging circumstances. In the spring of 1890, as the anatomy course was nearing an end, Dr. Mary Black Palmer urged me to build a vacancy she had recently made at the Kalamazoo State Hospital for the insane. I had always had an unreasoning fear of insane people, but accepted after talking to Dr. Palmer, Mary's husband, and the superintendent. I was to receive a salary of $75 a month for special care of the women insane patients. My first duty was to look after new patients and record any new marks or bruises found on the body. The first examination I made necessitated passing through a convalescent ward. That was easy. A mildly disturbed ward. That was worse. And then into a violent ward where the patient was being bathed. Trembling and breathless with fear, I reached the patient, observed her, and then dreaded the trip back to the office. I would have gladly climbed out the window or escaped by the roof. However, I must retrace my steps through the wards that were filled with the patients whom I feared. When I was in the middle of the mildly disturbed ward, I heard running feet behind me. My heart stood still. I tried to scream but could not. I could not even turn my head. Nearer and nearer the running steps came. A heavy slap on my back, a whisper in my ear. Who are you? Before I could see my assailant, she had fled out of sight, but she took with her all of my fears. No insane patient has ever since frightened me. Dr. Palmer was years in advance in the care of the insane. There were no restraints applied to patients and no special nurses assigned to suicidal or homicidal cases. Many of the patients from the overcrowded hospital in Kalamazoo were transferred to the Pontiac State Hospital. The young physician who came for them asked, Which ones are suicidal and need special nurses? None has a special nurse. All sleep in a ward and are never alone. Given plenty of time, people will always put off doing things, even to committing suicide. Instead of accepting this hypothesis, the young man, as soon as he had returned with his charges, placed two special nurses on one of the worst cases. Although the patient had made no such attempt in many years at Kalamazoo, a week later, she committed suicide, which she accomplished by jumping upon a chair and falling backwards, breaking her neck. She did this in the few minutes while the nurses chatted during the interchange of duty. I came to look upon insanity as a living death more than a disease. I often visited a sweet, delicate little lady whose delusion was that she was dead. She thought that anything that would kill anybody else could not harm her, because she was already dead. She was so obsessed with the idea that she very rarely stopped talking about being dead long enough for me to introduce a more pleasant subject. If I wore a hat, she would beg me to take my hairpin and thrust it deeply into her heart. Death. That would kill anyone, wouldn't it? Try it on me. Run it right into my heart. It will not kill me. At other times, she begged me to choke her for 15 minutes. Choke me. That would kill anyone except me. Choke me. I'm already dead. It she, won't kill me. she was constantly conjuring up some new and fantastic method for producing death and urging everyone she met to try it on her. Her husband came frequently to take her for a drive. On one of these occasions, she seemed so like her normal self that instead of hitching up the horse and accompanying her back to her room, he allowed her to return at, alone at her earnest request. It was not long before the nurses missed her. Search was instituted, and her decapitated body was found lying on the railroad track that ran the back of the asylum. I had been in Kalamazoo more than a year when I had typhoid fever, with two relapses, carrying a very high temperature, and for nine weeks and in a coma at the last. Just before the attack, while eating a hearty dinner with my colleagues in the asylum dining room, I made a remark. People should not fear death. I myself have absolutely no fear of death. Had that, one of the assisting physicians, Dr. Tullidge, whose father was a Presbyterian minister, spoke. You do not know what you're talking about. Sitting there the picture of health, it sounds absurd. Well, I 
cannot prove it today, but I may someday. After leaving the table, I felt a chill and could not get warm, though I stood in front of a hot radiator until the keys in my hands almost burned me. Finally, I went to bed and was lying smothered under seven blankets when Dr. Palmer found me and took my temperature. It was 107. I was delirious. When the doctor who had been appointed to take charge of my case visited me, I would plead with him day after day, tell Dr. Tullidge that I am not afraid to die. Why didn't you let me die yesterday? I am not afraid. I proved my point, though I nearly lost my life and all my hair while doing it. Shortly after recovering from, my, from typhoid, I learned that the New England Hospital for Women and Children was looking for a resident. I set out for Boston, stopping at Montclair, New Jersey, to visit Alice, who had just returned from her honeymoon in England. I was concerned only about my professional ability. Alice differed. You will never get the place unless you buy yourself some new clothes. She took me to Athlone, New York, where I was fitted out. As a Midwestern woman with little clinical experience, I had little hope of being the successful candidate. There was only one other applicant, and she was well fitted for the position. But the board of medical women who made the selection liked my personal appearance, and I was chosen. Upon completing nearly four years of hospital training for New England Hospital for Women and Children, I was in heat for private practice and would have begun at once had not Alice entrusted me with a precious secret. I'm going to have a baby. When? In June, I think. Fear, hope, joy, a tumult of emotions almost choked me. The year after I had graduated from medicine, Alice changed her vocation and entered the medical department of the University of Michigan. During her years of teaching, she had saved money in anticipating a trip to Europe. The opportunity came the summer of her junior year, and it was her maiden voyage in more senses than one, for she returned a bride. Joseph Comstack Jones, at the time he married Alice, was head of the educational department of Harper and Brother Publishers. When the company discontinued publishing school books two years later, it was a staggering blow, for it meant Joe must look for another position. Alice and Joe had planned to go to the farm in Stony Creek and remain till Joe could find a job. I readjusted my plans that I might be with Alice at this crucial time and take a much needed rest before choosing a location for beginning private practice. That circumstances should enable the baby to share the ancestral home of my mother, my sister and I, was as much of a miracle as birth itself. That I should deliver the baby was a presupposed fact. Had I not been studying medicine for the past 12 years to take on this precious responsibility? So the waiting days grew into weeks, the anxious weeks passed into months, until, at long last, on a rare June morning, Alice said, I have a pain, not severe, but it soon goes but soon returns. And then the birth watch began. Joe who was much older than Alice, was, looked years older, for he was anticipating impending danger. My sister was his second wife. His first wife's first child had been born dead, and with the birth of his third child, both wife and baby had succumbed. Nonetheless, there was a smile on his face as he endeavored to make the time pass pleasantly by taking Alice to a seat on the porch and reading a book to her or talking over a book he had just read. I realized too keenly that we might encounter storms, for this was the first baby, and Alice was, was of 35 years of age. Therefore, I did not try to shorten this period of calm. The labor began in the morning, continued all the afternoon, and though pains came regularly and forcefully, an examination indicated that this, the first stage of labor, had only been initiated. There was so little that anyone could do at this stage that it seemed wise for everyone to lie down and get as much rest as possible. I felt that I must see Alice every hour and listen to the baby's heart. Since the beginning of Alice's labor, I rehearsed all the deliveries I had ever seen or conducted. It was still dark, just before the dawn. I closed my eyes and particularized preparations for the delivery. The dawn seemed to be whipping everything into motion in life. Stepping to the long south porch, I saw on the horizon a gleaming crescent, tinted with blood-like stain, rise and grow into a blushing head that led the way till out of darkest night to Mother Earth was born a day. It was the 23rd of June. I thought at that time, and still 
ascended with the aid of instruments, the baby moved, turned, and descended until the birth. But it was a waxen baby that I saw. No piercing cry, only a soggy limp mat. I held the baby by the feet, head downward, no sign of life. I was weary, but not willing to give up. Seated on the floor with my mouth against the baby, I sucked out the air and blew in my own breath into those delicate little lungs. For one half hour, this method of artificial respiration continued without a sign of life in that pallid little form. Joe came in. The baby is dead. Anyone can see that. Please, care for Alice. Don't let anything happen to her. Get out. Thirty-five minutes passed and nothing. Not even a twitch of the tongue gave evidence of life. Forty minutes. Did I imagine it? Or was there a fluttering of the heart? I thought I had felt a tremor in the baby's tongue. Forty-five minutes. I was not deceived. A gasp. That was all I needed. Now I could work, unconscious of fatigue. Another gasp. One every minute. One every half minute. Oftener and oftener. A faint, pink tint stole over the baby's body. The heart was visibly beating. The baby was breathing regularly. It was a girl. My little girl. And had I not breathed the breath of life into her when her own father had said she was dead? And I, I wondered if God felt as I had when he created life. Although the baby was breathing regularly, she was cold in spite of the warm bath in which she was lying. Joe, let a fire in the Franklin stove. Mother, get flannel clothes for us. Grandmother, think of it, you're a grandmother. With hot flannels changed constantly, the little body gradually became warm. From seven in the evening until four in the morning, I pour heat into that tiny little body, just as I had for one hour, breathe air into her lungs. I wrapped her in a papoose pillow and charted a new life. The year that my niece, Sarah, was born, 1892, I began the practice of medicine. At long last, I was a woman physician. Nonetheless, I spent many days trying to make an unregrettable decision in solving the question where. Some wisdom had come in the senior year of my medical course, where I sat at meals between two of my literary classmates studying for their PhD degrees. I wish I could decide. Buck? Never waste time in making decisions. Huff and I tried for one year not to make any decisions unless it was acutely necessary. Our slogan was every hour brings light. During the year I made one decision and afterwards regretted it. But Huff never made one. Until there was a moment for it, he had only had one thing to do, and he did it. I kept that advice in mind. Every hour brings light. In terms of where I would practice, my eyes were centered on four cities. St. Louis, Louis, Boston, Detroit, and Milwaukee. Before casting the die, I thought it best to see Milwaukee. Aunt Julia had decided to go to Chicago for millinery stock. She invited me to accompany her, and we would go by boat across Lake Michigan to Milwaukee. There I had a cousin who was a surgeon who could refer me to all of his obstetric, pediatric, and medical cases. After a day of sightseeing with Cousin Ernest, Aunt Julia suggested a delay in my office hunting in Milwaukee. It has been such a full day. Hadn't you better wait until tomorrow to look at offices? You can catch up with me tomorrow in Chicago. I'm going with you to Chicago tonight. In Chicago at 5 o'clock the next morning, we walked up Water Street, busy at that time with its wholesale, wholesale food markets. I stopped, took a look around, and announced to Aunt Julia, I like the way it smells here. I shall practice here. Why, this is just a wholesale street. You know nothing yet about Chicago. You don't have even one acquaintance here in Chicago. Why don't you practice in Milwaukee? But I did not see the light until we reached Chicago. It is all the colors of the rainbow. Although I located in Chicago without rhyme or reason, I have never reconsidered or changed my mind, and never at any time have I regretted it. If I ever felt for a man what I had experienced for Chicago, I would not only have proposed in 
bought both the wedding and engagement wings, but also procured the marriage license. In Illinois in 1892, before the day of state board examinations, it was necessary to get three recognized physicians to sign in applications for state license to practice. Dr. Hickey Carr, Dr. Marie Mergler, and Dr. Sarah Hatchett Stevenson signed my application. With a license to practice in my profession, I put my foot firmly on the gas. The go sign was up, and I passed from civilian to professional life. In less than a week of waiting, I received a call to come at once at the second apartment at 36 in Cottage Grove Avenue. I had no telephone, but considered myself lucky that the druggist at Calmont and 43rd Street would deliver messages at any time, day or night. I took a streetcar and found myself at the home of Dr. Hickey Carr. Did you get a call to come at once? Yes. And were you greatly excited? Have you been going over in your mind how you would treat this emergency, that acute disease? Did it give you a great thrill? Yes, it did. Well, although there is no one ill, I could not resist the temptation to give you that big thrill. <laughs> However, I am not so heartless as to get you here and have nothing to offer you. I have made an appointment for you to serve three days as emergency physician at the dedication of the Columbian World Fair. When I announced my World Fair's appointment at the boarding house dinner that night, I was looked upon as a real personage. From that day, the solution of a problem of a clientele was assured, and fear was never my companion, except on one occasion. Four o'clock, one Sunday morning, I was wakened by a ring at the door of my basement office suite where I was sleeping. Looking out the reception window, I saw a ramshackle buggy, an emaciated horse, and a boy of about 16. What do you want? Uh, tell the doctor to come. The baby's having convulsions. Where's the baby? On uh, 49th and State Street. I've come to take the doctor there. All right. I'll be ready in a minute. I'm the doctor. A young medical woman was spending the night with me. Her eyes grew wide when I shared my fear. This is another Crohn case I feel sure of it. About five years before I had come to Chicago, Dr. Cronin, a prominent physician, had been lured out on a night call. His dead body had not been found for many weeks after his disappearance. Don't go. I shall go. However, if I'm not back by 6 o'clock, notify the police. I prepared myself and went out to meet the boy at the buggy. The boy regarded me with alarm and confusion, but made no sign of moving. I thought you were in a hurry. I gave him an accusing look as I climbed in and seated myself in the shabby turnout. He seated himself beside me, pulled the horse around, and we went rattling down Grand Boulevard. When we reached State Street and 59th, he stopped at the intersection. Get out here, walk two houses down, go between them to the back of the lot where there's a house. Climb up two stairs to the top floor. It's there. I walked through the narrow passage to the house in the rear and climbed the creaking stairs to find an open door. I walked through and without knocking, opened first a door with the living room and then a door into a kitchen. Here I saw a man holding a baby that was in violent convulsions and two women kneeling before a picture of the Virgin Mary. My fear was transformed into action. The baby's temperature was 107 degrees. I ordered a wash tub and two pails and stripped the clothing from the burning baby. Using the pails, I continued to pour cold water over the baby until its temperature dropped to 101 degrees. I took the baby out of the tub and began to ask questions. When did this begin? The baby took sick yesterday. Dr. Van Duzer, our family doctor, was called. He stayed till 2 o'clock this morning, but after he had gone, the baby got worse and we called for him to come back, and he'll be here any minute. Without presenting a bill, or making any explanation of my conduct, I left the ho house, frankly hoping to foster the thought that I had visited the baby as mediator to the Holy Mother. On my way home, I stopped to call on Dr. Van Duzer. I told him what I had done for his patient, omitting my foolish fears and the behavior of the boy who clearly had misgivings about bringing him, me rather than Dr. Van Duzer to the baby's home. I had tried all night to get the parents to consent to me giving the baby a cold bath. I 
was amused when I thought how helpless those same people had been to prevent me from doing so, for to stem the tide of my recovery from fear. Never since have I lost confidence in the public, or suspected anyone of attempting to injure me. A test, however, awaited me for which I was not prepared. It came to me early in the second year of my practice. It was the death of a patient. The hospital where I operated was poorly equipped and without doubt the patient was infected during the operation. For six harrowing days I stayed in almost constant attention until she died. When the end finally came, I realized that I, her physician, and no one else must write in statistical form the diagnosis and cause of death. Her record to stand for all time, a silent witness to the limitations of my profession. The death certificate, however, did not make an end to all further thought of the patient. Months passed during which there were times when I cried out, begging my ghostly companion to leave me, if only for a few moments of respite, but she never left my side. Her relatives and friends had grieved and then gone on with their lives. How surprised they would have been if they had known that I, who had seemed so scientifically calm and unemotional, was wearing myself out with the problem of what might have been done to save that human life. Death was an Achilles thrust that brought me to a keen and pointed sense of failure and overwhelmed me with helplessness. A child's death, especially, is a breach of nature I have been fortunate in having lost but two children in many operations. The mother of one of these children was a Jewish, married many years when she came to me for relief from sterility. After months of treatment, we were rewarded, and I laid in her arms a beautiful baby girl. When the child was about five years old, I was called, and only a moment was necessary to diagnose a ruptured appendix. I took the child in my arms and with the mother went to the, drove to the women's hospital where Dr. J. B. Murphy confirmed my diagnosis. I operated at once and found a ruptured appendix. In 24 hours, the child was dead. I was frenzied with grief. I could not eat or sleep. In my misery, I called Dr. Murphy. Dr. Murphy, that child you saw with me died 24 hours after the operation. Do you think if I had- My dear girl, I know just how you feel, but you must forget it. That child was doomed before you or I ever saw her. Operate on another patient as soon as you get an opportunity. Do not let this ruin a good surgeon. Such understanding and kindly advice brought me back to a healthy and courageous state of mind, and my gratitude has grown with the years. Two months after I encountered death in my medical practice, it touched my immediate family. I received a telegram from the farm asking me to come on account of my father. I went to the railway station and boarded a car. Father loved the railroad, and I remembered as I sat in the light, poorly lighted car, how hard father had worked to have a spur of the Michigan Central from Detroit to Bay City survey through Rochester. When father used to drive me back and forth to school, if a train was approaching Rochester, he would stop the horses and watch the lumbering, lurching freight cars under the thick, thick streamer of thick black smoke until the little red caboose was out of sight. Then he tripped to the horse and slapped her back with the reins. God didn't make that. Man made it. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> When I arrived at the farm, I found that father had had a severe headache for many days and that his gait was particular. He was admitted as a patient to the Harper Hospital in Detroit. Dr. J. H. Carsons, an old friend in the women's hospital, examined him. I fear I can do nothing for him. As he predicted, no one could help my father. And after lying in a semi-comatose condition for two weeks, he died. From early childhood, my ambition had been to please my father, to hear him say, That's, That's right. right. Make, Make them, them hunt their holes. Let, Let them know there's a God in Israel. In my second year of practice, 
I often had so many calls that I rented a horse from the neighboring livery stable. One day, when my practice had reached a point where I rented the horse every day for a week, the manager of the stable came to me. I think you need a horse, not to buy one. I haven't enough money and won't go into debt. How much could you pay? Only $75. You may have the horse for that. I'll throw in the harness, buggy, yes, the whip and the lap rope. How proud I was to be a real horse and buggy doctor at last. I wanted to focus my practice in obstetrics, but to specialize in obstetrics would brand me a midwife, a Cinderella stepsister to the usurping man midwife. Perhaps in the long run, it might be wiser to apply myself to surgery until I had gained recognition. Then I could turn my attention to obstetrics. I took steps to acquire independence in operating. Opportunity, as usual, soon knocked. I met Dr. William Quine, Dean of the College of Physicians and Surgeons at the University of Illinois College of Medicine. What are you doing since the woman's medical school has been closed? I am chief gynecologist and surgeon in my own private practice. Well, that's fine, but how would you like to be professor of clinical gynecology at the College of Physicians and Surgeons and conduct a surgical clinic every week? Nothing would please me more. Well, the students are a rough lot. I have known them throw professors that they did not like right out the window. <laughs> but can you operate so automatically that you can give at the same time a lecture that is both instructive and systematic? I did not hesitate. I raised my fist and brought it down on a thud on his desk, which sent the papers rattling and the ink bottle jumping. I will. Now, isn't that remarkable? That is the only answer I would have accepted, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> At that time, I was not aware that the majority of the faculty were strongly against me on the acknowledged ground of my sex, and it meant a faculty fight with the odds against the dean. I never knew what was done to put it over, but Dean Klein is very clever. It was more than a month before I received word of my appointment. One night, near midnight, the telephone rang. Hello? Uh, who is this? Dr. Van Hoosen. Oh, no. Who is this? Dr. Van Hoosen. Oh, no, no. Well, who do you think it is? I am speaking to the professor of clinical gynecology at the College of Physicians and Surgeons. <laughs> Drop into my office soon. Good night. <laughs> One of the challenges in maintaining the position was getting hospitals to accept my patients after surgery. West Side Hospital, where most of the patients were sent following the surgical clinics in the college, sent me a letter. It stated that I would be denied privilege of having my patients cared for in their hospital. Day and night, I thought of ways and means by which I might continue my practice independently of Westside Hospital. And it was not long before this plan crystallized. I could rent a vacant store across the street and set it up as a six-bed charity hospital. I secured a superintendent, a resident nurse, a couple of nurses, and an undertaker required for hospital licensure. We could use his ambulance every Saturday morning to transport the patients back and forth from the little, little hospital across the street to the college amphitheater. When all the details of the plan were perfected, I went with them to Dr. Quine. I am not going to waste any time or energy fighting the hospital staff and their unwarrantable prejudice against me, but I have a plan of action. When I told him of the new hospital setup we named Gynecium, he was thrilled, putting his arm around me and patting me on the head with a look never to be forgotten. He baptized me. Why, little girl, I thought you were dead. You were just born. In the eight years that we conducted the clinic, we never ran out of operative patients. The clinic increased my difficulty in keeping up a large general practice. Still, I was growing stronger in diagnosis and rapidly building up my surgical practice. Because I was devoting so much of my time to teaching and conducting free clinics, I did not feel I could spare a minute for social activities. When one of my grateful patients took no end of trouble of making me a member of the Chicago, Chicago Women's Club, I was dismayed rather than pleased. I never attended any meetings, but found it a real surprise when I could 
work for the club in capacity as a women physician. The Committee on Social Purity of the Women's Club asked the women physicians who were members of the club to give a, a course of lectures on sex. I felt too an inexperience to speak on any sex problem, but I was so sure of myself in the field of anatomy that I suggested that I might tell them something about the physiology and anatomy of the sexual organs, both male and female. Finding that subject is so fundamental that you must give the first lecture. At once I saw the predicament I had wished upon myself. If my audience did not like the talk, they would never return for the really fine lectures given by my colleagues. I was worried and spent many days writing out speeches only to tear them up until I thought of a simple device that would help me out with my problem. I would illustrate my talk by first drawing on the blackboard the sex sexual organs of a three-month-old fetus, a baby six months before birth, and from this innocent beginning, develop by sketches the female organs to the right and the male organs to the left. My lecture would be followed in time by the lectures from the other female physicians to follow adolescent problems, marriage advice, sex psychology, and so forth. Mrs. Charlton Roten, president of the club in 1903, always introduced me. She paid my presentations a high compliment. As many times as I've heard you speak on the same subject, I am never bored, and in close, I stand spellbound looking at your audience. They are wrapped in admiration over the drawing on the board, as if they were of a rare and beautiful flower instead Eventually, of I gave this and similar, similar lectures to many high school and college audiences. Many in the audience, I'm sure, wondered about why I had never chosen to marry. In June 1934, at the 50th reunion of my literary class at U of M, I voiced my feelings. I can't understand why Bertha never married. After we graduated, I would have wagered she would have been the first girl to marry. I too. Why didn't you? Would you really like to know? Wouldn't you be offended if I told you? Oh, tell us. No, please, please tell, tell us. us. Well, if the boys when I was of a marriageable age had been like the boys of today, I would have set up a male harem. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone gasped, but only one spoke. You mean we were never good enough for you? From the beginning, <laughs> my medical career was the medium through which everything that sustained me must filter. I took no vacations, never read the newspapers, limited my reading to medicine, and seldom allowed my thoughts to wander far from my professional duties. At times, I would be too deep in thought to get out of my station on the elevated, passing it two or three times. I did have a desire for culture, even during these busy years, so I bought a season ticket to the opera. But the dates conflicted so much with duties that I gave most of the tickets to friends. However, I made the grade one night and was very happy when the curtain rose and the musical drama began. The next thing I knew, Alice was poking me in the ribs. You'd better wake up if you want to see the killing. <laughs> I had slept through the entire opera, including the intermissions. Since then, I have recommended Grand Opera for insomnia, pleasant, sexual, <laughs> and no side effects. <laughs> After returning from one of my trips to Europe, I learned that the Civil Service Board of Cook County, for the first time, was to hold competitive examinations for a spot on the gynecological staff at the Cook County Hospital. In my academic and professional career, I had taken very few examinations so I was curious to see what I could make on paper. And I was eager to get a position that would mean operating an entire morning two or three times a week on patients that were too poor to ever become or send private pain patients. 300 men physicians took the exam offered by Cook County or the Civil Service Board. I was the only woman physician. That I make make first place which would entitle me to become head of the gynecological staff had never occurred to me. And I refused to believe the good news until I actually received the card with my mark and grade on it and notification to begin service in September 1913. Soon after my notification, one of the newly appointed associates came to my office. Dr. Van Hoosen, 
I regret to tell you that the civil service examiners made a mistake in marking our papers. Another position has really made first place. I did not scream or pound the floor with my heels, but I felt just like a baby whom a dog had snatched a piece of candy. I will go to the civil service rooms. You know the doctor who made first place is a foreigner, and I am sure they will not want him to be treated unfairly. I will go to the civil service rooms. There are a number of plans. All who have taken the test might resign and take another test. I will go to the civil service rooms. You can petition the civil service board to give the foreign-born man who made the rightful place his rightful place. I will go to the civil service rooms. You could offer him your position and step down to the position as associate. I will go to the civil service room. It will be of no use to go to the civil service room, for the board has already placed the position in the eligible. I will go to the, the civil eligible. service rooms. I am not sure they will do it no more unless a great pressure is made. That he is a foreigner, we should see that justice is done. My interceding associate position remained with me an hour, but I could find nothing I dared trust myself say except. I will go to the civil service rooms. I was glad to see him depart. And when I reached home, I cried. All night my mind seized and swirled. In the morning, I went to the Women and Children's Hospital, saw my patients, and started for home. Returning by the long route through Douglas Park in order to get a hold of myself. Western Avenue was bleak and lonely. And while riding between vacant lots and open spaces, I reached such a state of morbid depression but I actually heard a voice. He, he is, is a, a foreigner. foreigner. All was clear. I now knew what I was going to do. I stepped up the tortoise-like speed of my electric automobile and rushed home and called a member of the Civil Service Board. I understand that I did not make first place, but may I ask that the naturalization papers of all physicians who took the, who took the test to be verified? It's just too bad for those doctors to worry you. They have made so much trouble that everyone has been annoyed with them. As to the naturalization papers, it's very doubtful that a mistake has been made. Nevertheless, since you request it, the naturalization papers of all foreigners who took the examination shall be reinspected. I heard no more of this mistake until a month later, when I was looking over intern's papers with Dr. Stowe. They're going to increase the number on the gynecological staff, and I'm going on service with you in the fall. Why, what about the physician who was placed first on the eligible list? I guess you know. I know nothing. He and two others did not have their naturalization papers. Oh, your voices. What did you say? Uh, this is a good paper. Oh. <laughs> when I w went to Cook County Hospital to begin my service, if I had been sure that there had been a mistake in looking over the naturalization papers and not in marking the examination, I would not have entered the warden's office with an adjective with agitation and a distressing inferiority complex. I waited three quarters of an hour without receiving any attention. I finally approached the warden's desk. May I be shown to the woman's surgical ward? He looked at me fiercely. Who are you? Dr. Van Hoosen, head of the gynecological staff. Well, if you've come here with a chip on your shoulder, you're in the wrong pew. I did not warn him that I had a whole wood pile on my shoulder. <laughs> But stunned by such an unprovoked assault, I spoke up. I came to work. Show me the woman's ward. He called the resident physician to conduct me to the intern on service. However, a crucial last test lay before me. One of the staff physicians came in early this morning and divided up the surgical patients. We have two for you to operate on this morning. The first is a large ovarian tumor. I would like to examine the first case. That's unnecessary. She's all prepared with stale drapes and everything. I had never operated on a patient without making an examination, and though I did not want to appear a fussy woman, I was determined to diagnose the case myself. I am sorry. I know I seem unreasonable, but drapes are no drapes. I must examine the patient. All right. You may. I inspected the case and found that instead of an ovarian tumor, the woman was pregnant. <laughs> Full term. I implored the intern. Please call the doctor who said this was an ovarian tumor. I would like to see him in consultation. Of course. The doctor came, and after passing his hand lightly over the enlarged abdomen. Why do we have an ovarian tumor? At this I broke. Take the patient away. I never want to see her again. Without further conversation, I repaired to the operating room 
and began to scrub for the second operation. When I had cooled off, I returned to the ward and listened to the heartbeat of the ovarian tumor. <laughs> I offered the stethoscope to my intern. Listen. Oh yes, we're all agreed that it's a baby, not a tumor. <laughs> if in my first case, I had made such a stupid and careless mistake as to operate for a tumor and find a pregnancy, I would not have been able to outlive this damning deed. It has taught me that henceforth I must walk gingerly. After my first year of service, I discovered I was especially fortunate in being first choice of the interns who would be the candidates in the competitive examination for Cook County internships. During my 13 year service in the big county hospital, I had the satisfaction of conducting more than three score young men into the field of surgery. Long after midnight, the Cook County intern might be found writing up histories or making laboratory tests. The staff and interns worked harder than any doctor had, but without pay. Once, my intern, a young man with perfect social training, pointed to the door of his room. Oh, by the way, if you ever feel tired, want to rest, take a nap, just use my room as if it were your own. Thank you. <laughs> I shuddered at the stir it would make if I was caught fast asleep, on my, like Goldilocks, on my intern's bed. Several years later, I laughingly told the Another intern about the gentlemanly offer. He looked at me with eyes wide like a four-year-old's. <laughs> you don't know us interns. Why, you could go into any man's room and do anything you care to, and if some fellow should criticize you, why, we'd take him out into the alley and beat him to a jelly. <laughs> <laughs> In 1918, I was invited to serve as acting head and professor of obstetrics in the Loyola University Medical School. I was responsible for the 15 teachers in my department and for initiating the improvements to move the school towards age race status with the American Medical Association. After two years of work, I resigned from the Women and Children's Hospital to become the only woman on staff at the Francis Willard Hospital located next door to the Loyola Medical School. The medical school and the adjacent hospital provided an opportunity for the fulfillment of one of my dreams, the creation of a big maternity hospital for the middle class working people, where a woman for a $50 flat rate could be delivered and then given 10 days care, while at the same time her young children were kept in an adjoining creek under the same management. The fulfillment of this dream, however, appeared for a while to be secured upon my dismissal from the project. Quite accidentally, after asking the hospital clerk to get me some blanks, my eye caught a letter on her desk. I knew that I ought not to read it, but I <coughs> saw that it was about me. And I not only read it, I reread it. The letter was from the American Medical Association to the Loyola University School of Medicine. We congratulate Loyola University School of Medicine. Our recent survey has resulted in placing the school among the grade A institutions. We recommend that you put a man at the head of the Department of Obstetrics. I was not prepared for such an exhibition of sex prejudice from the AMA, of which I had been a member for a quarter of a century. However, I did not intend to make Loyola suffer for my sex. The following day, I spoke to the dean in the corridor of the hospital. I am so delighted that we have the A grade, but I consider the standing and growth of an institution of learning so much more important than the interests of an individual that I would be unhappy to hamper in any way the future of Loyola. More than that, I want you to know that my time with you has been its own reward. What are you talking about? You've been appointed head of obstetrics, and there's nothing more to discuss. Hasn't Father Fury written you? No. He will. I reported this conversation to Alice. Who laughed? That was a beautiful speech you gave to the dean. Now they will feel free to let you out. A week later. Hasn't Father Fury written yet? No. All right, they'll let you down easy. A week later. Got your letter. No. <laughs> the next day, I had a telephone message to meet Father Fury at 7 in the evening at St. Ignatius High School. I'm so sorry. You are so busy, I should not have intruded on your time. But you must forgive me. It was an old man's weakness. 
I wanted to tell you face to face that you have been appointed head of obstetrics of the Loyola University School of Medicine. We appreciate the splendid work you've done in helping us get an A grade. I know there is a prejudice against women, and we are prejudiced too, but it is for you and not against you. I did not sink to the floor and clasp his feet, nor did I fall upon his neck and cover it with tears and kisses. But I am sure that his cloth was all that kept my feelings pent up inside like a singing tea kettle. I had to labor against discrimination against women in the medical field most of my life. In the fall of 1915, I invited a group of women whom I knew to be enthusiastic for organization to meet at the Chicago Women's Club. At the meeting, the medical women were organized. The press and many friends have often hailed me as the founder of the American Medical Women's Association, but it is the success, the success of the organization is attributed to the service and dedication of its members. Another benefit I provided for women physicians began when I operated for out-of-town MDs in their hometown hospitals. The woman MD who called on another male doctor in her own hometown to operate on her patient tactically acknowledged that he was the better man. And when the patient again needed care, she naturally went to the male doctor. It was to promote these women that I undertook to do their surgical work in their own lo locality. Unconsciously, I started a new kind of practice, that of a circuit surgeon. In Muskegon, Michigan, for example, I operated for Dr. Lynette Powers and Dr. Lucy Ames, and in one day, we performed 19 operations. Many patients that I operated on never met me and did not even know my name. Nothing excites the pride of a young medic more than being asked to make a sick call for a busy, well-established colleague. Dr. Hickey Carr, who had endorsed my, endorsed my applications for licensure, was the first physician to so honor me. However, I was guilty of taking most unethical revenge on one of Dr. Carr's patients. With a blizzard rage and all means of transportation fast failing, a patient of Dr. Carr wanted me to come and see her at once. My horse kid was harnessed to the buggy, and with her head lowered to face the driving gusts of snow, her legs straining to drag the wheels through the drifts, we reached the home of the sick lady. I waded up to my knees in the sticky snow. The patient was sitting before a blazing Greek fire in a becoming house gown with her slippered feet on the fender. I am sure she heard no irony in my voice. I hope you suffered no discomfort while waiting for me. What can I do for you? All day, I have had a kind of a she badly imitated a hacking cough. My self-control utterly disappeared. Well, well, we shall see to that naughty cough. Take off all your clothes and hop into bed. Is it bad? Oh, we will see. I made a thorough examination. I peered into her throat, turned back the upper eyelid, pulled her ears backward and forward. I pinched, patted, and percussed every inch of her body. I drummed a tattoo on her chest and abdomen. I made an exploration of every orifice. When I could think of nothing more to do, I gave her my prognostication. You will feel worse tomorrow, but don't worry. These powders will fix you. Thereupon, I gave her several super doses of chamomile to be followed with Epsom salts. Stay in bed for two days. As I unblinketed kid and tramped about in the snow, I had no more resentment. I was even. When I first came to the house, Alice met me. The patient must have been pretty bad to come out in this weather. She had nothing to do today, so she called for the doctor. But tomorrow, she will be busy. <laughs> <laughs> Several months later, Dr. Carr and I were having a little chat. By the way, I have always intended to ask you what you gave my patient last winter. She said it was wonderful for you to come in such a blizzard and give her such a complete examination. Oh, she insisted she wasn't really sick when you came, but the next day she thought she was going to die. <laughs> oh, at any rate, you must have prevented
prevented her from having any real illness. What was it you gave her? I looked mystified and did not answer. Oh, you don't remember? <laughs> it is of no importance, never mind. Dr. Carr never referred to the subject again, and I tried to forget that I, her physician, had so completely disregarded my Hippocratic oath. In October of 1922, Sarah Alice and I began a trip that was to take us to Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia, and the Orient. I had been advised to spend three winters in a warm climate to relieve my bronchial asthma. In Shanghai, we were a short distance from the mission conducted by Dr. Mary Stone. I felt a bond of love and interest with Dr. Stone and earlier her co-worker, Dr. Ida Khan, two Chinese women doctors devoted to spreading Christianity, who both had links to the University of Michigan. Ida Khan had been adopted by Ms. Howe, a missionary from Adrian, Michigan. At birth, Ida was the seventh girl in a wealthy Chinese family. She was being carried to the home of prospective bridegroom parents. According to custom, just before the betrothal ceremony, her horoscope was read, and horror of horrors, whoever applied a trough to this baby was cursed, his life subject to, to grief and failure. Were she to be returned to her family, she would have been sold as a slave. Miss Howe adopted her, and then eventually sent her with Mary Stone to medical school at the University of Michigan. The irony of the horoscope became clear many years later, I learned. One day after dinner in Ning Chang, Mother Howe began to tell a story. The president of China. Mother Howe, please. In Tian Mother Howe, you mustn't. Please, Ida, you must let her continue. If she must. When Dr. Ida was practicing in Tian and doing some government work, the president of China came to Tian and offered her his hand in marriage. But Dr. Ida refused. Mother Howe had lived to see the baby girl with the bad horoscope turn down the highest marriage offer a Chinese woman could receive. When I think what happened after World War II to the Chinese medical religious centers I visited in 22, I feel the two gallon tea kettles used for sterilization and these facilities are now large enough to contain my precious tears for China. We were board, when we boarded the boat at Tianjin, China to go to Kobe, Japan, we had little realization that we would never again see the same beautiful China. If we could have realized that Japan would so ruthlessly destroy China, I fear we would never have even taken a peek into Japan. From Kobe, we went to Kota, Nara, Yokohama, and Nikko. We returned to Yokohama to prepare to sail back to Vancouver. Han I don't want to see any more ivory or jade or any more pagodas or temples. I would like to see the Japanese people as they really live. Little did I realize that on the following day, I was to get my wish. From Yokohama, we took a train to Tokyo. We arrived three minutes before noon. We were following the American Express boy who was taking our bags to the train station hotel lobby when suddenly I heard a noise of noises. It came from above and from below. It closed in on all sides. The elevator near which I was standing shook its chains like an enraged gorilla. My feet felt queer. Sarah seized my arm. Earthquake, hurry! We grasped each other by the arm and plunged toward the open door 20 feet away. Like a string of children playing crack the whip, we swayed this way and that, now falling to the floor, now rising as though on a crest of a wave. We reached the open door just in time to see a six-story stone building across the street collapse, and a cream-colored building next to it split open with the glass showered down upon the pavement. As suddenly as the quake had come, it was over. All was quiet. A plot of green grass with trees at the center, in the center of the plaza in front of the hotel, afforded a place of safety. I timed the aftershocks as we do labor pains on my watch. Now every two minutes, now every five minutes, now with an eight minute interval. In the two days following the first quake, I was told that 700 quakes had been registered. 
All afternoon of the day of the earthquake and the day after, we sat on a grass plot in the center of the plaza. A pile of grass mats, a short distance from where we were sitting, covered the dead that were being collected from the buildings nearby. There was no screaming, no loud talking, no excitement of any kind, a result of centuries of discipline. One of the Americans from the station hotel brought us a blanket, a kettle of drinking water, and advised us, Go to the park for the night. It's only a couple blocks away. You'll be safe there. The park was already full with Japanese, but we found enough space for our outspread blanket, on which we sat all night long, at times dropping to the ground for a week of sleep. The fires completely surrounded the park. There was very little talking. Here and there, we heard men carefully making their way through the crowds, calling out for the lost. At that time, I did not know that all the children in Tokyo of school age had been wiped out in the Holocaust of that day. The quake had come the 1st of September, 1923, the first day of school, just one minute before school was dismissed. The children were trapped in the falling buildings, her caught in the fires. While in Tokyo, I never saw a child of school age. On the morning of the third day, Mr. Jonas, a Eurasian, accosted the hotel group. I'm going to try to reach Kobe. If anyone wishes to join me, I'd be glad to have him. It will be uncomfortable, and we may have to face danger. We joined the party of 14. Not until we reached Kobe did we learn how severe the earthquake had been in Yokohama. The city had been completely demolished. The Grand Hotel, where we had stored our bags in preparation for returning to America, had been literally swallowed in the disaster with 169 guests, many of them Americans. Friends extended sympathy for the loss of nearly all our Chinese gifts and purchases. I assured them that the greatest valuables had not been destroyed. On the morning of November 23rd, 1933, I was in the Women and Children's Hospital at 7 o'clock when I read and reread the headline, Rita Weinkoop murdered. Who could have committed such a crime? Rita was the beautiful, delicate wife of the son of Alice Lindsay Winkoop. My acquaintance with Alice began in 1839, 1893, a half century earlier where she was a student in the Northwestern University Women's Medical School, where I was teaching embryology. I was very happy when, five years later, she married Dr. Frank Winkoop, who had devoted much of his time and given me, without remuneration, the instruction necessary to teach embryology. Imagine my horror when Alice herself was charged with the murder. I myself strove to collect irrefutable proof of her innocence, and I came to the belief that Rita was shot accidentally by an intruder. But my efforts were hopeless. The press really tried Dr. Winkoop. Every day she was hypothetically connected with some known crime, nor was it a matter of purely local interest. Every newspaper in the United States vied with those in Chicago in tearing her reputation to shreds. The stimulus for this interest and widespread publicity was, without doubt, to be found in the fact that Dr. Winkoop was a woman doctor. She had unwittingly stirred up old smothering fires of discrimination, and they burned with unquestionable ferocity. Alice was found guilty and sentenced to 25 years. A big opportunity to demonstrate my love for her came in the middle of December, 1943, she telegraphed me to come at once to the reformatory at Dwight, Illinois. My old pal, could I but grip your hand and sit where I could see you a while? I'd not need many words. Alice had sent for me to re advise her regarding her petition that would come up before the Division of Pardons and Paroles on January 11, 1944. We met, she talked rapidly, referred to notes, she was not the helpless, despairing prisoner. Her whole being was surcharged with dis directness and determination. 
When the doctor told me in September that there was a tiny spot on my lung, I suddenly made up my mind that if I should have a return of the tubercular trouble I had when a girl, I was not going to die here. For 10 years, I have daily expected the real murderer to confess and exonerate me. Now I have given up that idea, but I am going to get out of here. No matter what it costs, I have stayed here long enough. Her request was that I should appear before the Board of Pardons in Springfield, Illinois, and make a 30-minute plea. Whether for better or worse, if she wished me to make a plea, I could not refuse her. She, more than any other friend, had the right to ask me to lie my heart upon the chopping block and do it as a ha happy sacrifice. In such a spirit, I took upon myself my greatest responsibility in 80 years. Members of the Division of Pardons and Paroles, gentlemen, in petition for the pardon of Dr. Alice Lindsay Winfrew, two typewritten pages were required to record her social and medical prowess. It is therefore not necessary for me to review them. Few medical women in double the number of years have acquired recognition in as many fields, including medicine, education, and philanthropy. For the past 10 years, Dr. Wincoop, an innocent woman, has been imprisoned at the State Reformatory for Women at Dwight, Illinois, where she has performed every labor of which she is physically able. She has worn the clothing, eaten the food, kept the hours, and lived up to the rules of the institution. She has accepted limitations regarding visitors and correspondence. She has kept her mind young by reading current literature, the daily newspaper, medical journals, and all books and papers which thoughtful friends have sent her. In these past 10 long, monotonous years, the Bible has been her solace and prayer, which gives her strength and is ever on her lips and in her heart. Dr. Wincoop petitions His Excellency, the Governor of Illinois, for her liberty in order that the medical profession, all women, her sorority sisters, members of all the organizations to which she has belonged, her church, her friends, and most importantly, her family, may be spared the humiliation of having one of their own, though innocent, die within the prison walls. In every corner of the world, young men are fighting and dying that we may live in freedom. But in a small corner of no man's land, an old woman is fighting to live and living in the hope that she may die in freedom. My words are but a poor sample of what is in my heart. In your recommendation for her pardon, I sincerely pray that you may have divine guidance and inspiration of the golden rule. All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. More than that, no man can ask. Members of the Division of Pardons and Paroles, I thank you for listening to my plea for the liberty of Dr. Alice Lindsay Wincoop. Though my plea brought some of the members of the pardon board to the verge of tears, nevertheless, Dr. Wincoop was not granted a pardon. I had forgotten an impending election. The day following the plea, Dr. Lindsay Wincoop wrote me, How will all this terminate? It is now in God's hands. May the work done in his name have response conformatory to his will. Since petitions have been only for justice, then we have in reality asked only, Thy will be done. God grant it. I was glad that Dr. Wincoop could rest her case with the Lord. For myself, I swore in my father's words, I'll, I'll make them hunt their holes. I'll, I'll let them know there's a God in Israel. Israel. Alice and I should have recognized the vocational aptitude for farming Sarah displayed when a tiny top. It was not until she was on the eve of graduating from the University of Chicago with her bachelor's degree that she disclosed the allurement that the farm life had for her and her ambitions. Next fall, I will begin my pre-medical course and after I have my medical education, I will practice until I have earned enough money to buy a farm. How long do you think that will take? So that's what you want to do? Farm? Oh, yeah. But mother, I thought you and Gov wanted me to study medicine. Farming is not what it was when grandfather ran the farm. In these days, a farmer should be a graduate of an agricultural college. May I? The next week I went with Sarah to Madison, Wisconsin, 
where she articulated for the summer term in agricultural department of the University of Michigan to work toward a master's degree, majoring in animal husbandry. She continued on and received her PhD degree in 1921, after a delay occasioned by World War I. Mother died that year, the 27th of June. When niece Sarah entered upon her career as a farmer, I knew that Alice and I should build the remnants of our future around Sarah. With a home for all of us in Stony Creek, we set out to build, build set out fruit cheese and built a stone wall around the lot on which grandfather had erected the farmhouse 100 years before. During 1924, 25, and 26, the Stony Creek Village workmen completed the house, a visible expression of Alice's genius for homemaking. In the fall of 1927, Sarah took over the management of the farm. I was as proud as mother's peacock. Watching Sarah and Alice create a splendid estate out of the old rundown farm. To Sarah, the farm is helpful to her farming business. To Alice, it is a dream come true. To me, it is my shame girl out. Every nook and corner of the house has something of my life. My eye loves to rest on two camphor wood chests carved by the artful Chinese and filled with memories of the Orient. A small one we had paid five dollars for carved by the prisoners in Ning Chang, had been sent to the steamship offices in Shanghai, where it escaped destruction in the earthquake. Five years after returning from Ch China, Alice shared a regret. I don't see why I didn't get two of those trusts. I will write to Ida Khan and have her send another. At once, I mailed a check for $25 to Dr. Khan and requested her to duplicate the chest we had bought in Ning Chang and to keep any surplus money for her mission. A year later, we, re we received summons to the Custom House in Chicago to pay duty on a chest that had arrived from China. I found the officer on duty very attentive. This is quite a job with many papers to sign. Make yourself comfortable, and I will help speed up the process as much as possible. Every few moments, he beckoned me to come and sign some schedule until finally he asked me a question. Could this by any chance be an antique? Oh, my no. That chest was made and carved by prisoners in Nanchang, China. He looked so grave that I stopped talking. He retired to return shortly with the news. I'm so sorry, but the United States Commerce Regulation forces us to return the chest to China on the ground that it was made by convict labor. I have often had to make rapid surgical decisions, but now I realize that I must not even think if I was to save that chest for Alice. I tried to look guileless instead of guilty, and with much surprise as I could muster, I gave him an explanation. Oh, no, 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 no! I told you that that chest was made by... parishioners. Uh, excuse me, my mistake. <laughs> At once he brought the clearance papers. I have never tried to find out who made it or where it was made, for I prefer to think that accidentally I did not lie to that gracious customs officer. <laughs> Being a father figure to Alice gave to my life a supreme motive, for it was Sarah's whose life had been knitted into the pattern of my, of my days from the time when I carefully set up stitches to now when I am narrowing off. For 15 years after I began practice, I delivered patients in their homes, much the way I had delivered Sarah. I was called when the labor was evident, and I never left the patient until she had been delivered, whether it be hours or days. Many of my colleagues considered this a waste of time, but to me it is a practical application of the golden rule, which I have found to be unfailing in every solution to every problem and I have ever met in fulfillment of my Hippocratic oath. Obstetricians are of two categories. One delivers a baby, one attends a woman in labor. It has been a great joy to bring children into the world, harder to attend those who are leaving. The loss of a patient still starts me to question and forbids reconciliation. It develops in me an inferiority complex mingled with guilt. 
standing by the post-mortem table and facing the pathological cause of death. I am overpowered by my own inefficiency and the helplessness of my profession. It has taken many years and much suffering to learn that to die is as natural as to be born, and that without death, birth would become an even greater tragedy than death ever could be. But I have learned. I think it is getting late. Thank you for listening and sharing this time with me. I am a bit tired now. I think I will rest. Good night. <laughs>